fiction being about your emotional life. It takes a certain amount of courage, really, to read fiction, in the sense that you have to deal with emotion. And there's no such thing as somebody living in an Anglo-Saxon culture who welcomes dealing with emotion, but it's got to be done. Um, but I'm sure you'll, you can reflect and you will find periods where you, you were trying to work something out. So maybe you read everything by one author. Maybe it was Mark Twain. I don't know. Um, maybe it was Virginia Woolf. But you had to read everything. And you, you did it. And you went on to other things. But it, it, it's what you are today. It has made you what you are today. Have you ever had the experience of sitting down, whether it's in an airport or wherever you are? Maybe it's a restaurant, and somebody's reading a book that you're reading or you have read. And you start a conversation, and you've, you've met somebody with whom you're completely open. There's no reason to hide anything. You know, they, don't, they have nothing over you, you have nothing over them. They're not going to go back and tell your friends. And everything comes out because of this book. And there's this marvelous meaning of people. No other art form can do this. Music, of course, stirs you, particularly this classical music. I mean, three minutes for a popular song might give you something to hum and remember your youth by, but it's not really, doesn't move you. You know, not the way, say, Beethoven does, or Brahms, or the big ones, the big guys, so to speak. Uh, or Scott Joplin. You know, we don't have many serious composers in our culture because we don't value them. Uh, the way other cultures do. We, but we value literature. It's interesting. All across the world, there are people who have the gifts to write. There are people who have the, the gifts to compose and paint. But it's what the culture values that produces more of one art form than another. But music is instantly emotionally ac accessible. But it doesn't necessarily lead you into opening yourself with others. You simply enjoy it with others. You may weep with others. You know, Rachmaninoff can get a good tear out of you sometimes. Um, film. You say, well, film. Well, film is essentially the younger sister of literature. But it's different in that you're passive. You're just sitting there. And these images are shoved at you. And you respond. And, and you may learn something. But no film can carry more than one main plot, two subplots at most. It, it simply can't. The ideal film is still 90 minutes long. Of course, they've all gone over that now. But, but it takes a long time to go through what is in a big novel or a big book, The Rise and Fall of the Roman Empire, the most magisterial prose written in the English language. It takes weeks, months, maybe years. A film, you're in, you're out. You may be terribly moved. I remember the year of living dangerously, and I thought it was really rather an extraordinary film and literary in many levels. Um, but here's the difference about why you're so passive. If you watch Alfred Hitchcock, there's a, there's a quietness, even in the scenes with action. He allows you to find what is most important in the scene. Martin Scorsese, no. They're both great directors, but Scorsese shuts it right at it. You're going to see exactly what he wants you to see when he wants you to see it. Hitchcock trusts you. <coughs> Mr. Scorsese does not. <laughs> but they're both great directors, and they've made fabulous films, obviously. Um, but the, the actor is the embodiment of, you know, if, if it's the translation of a novel. Everything is there for you. You really don't have to think very much. But if you're reading War and Peace, you imagine Bokonski. He's your Bokonski. He looks at you thinking, he should look. And the same with Natasha. So that in some way, you're actually participating in this creation along with Tolstoy. That's why it gets you. You, you, you are so involved in a way you are not. Same with the painting. You see it, it's, it's incredible. I mean, w w whether it's Renaissance or whether it's modern, whatever your tastes are, it certainly affects you. But you're not part of it. You're just looking at it. Or, uh, maybe I'm insensitive. Maybe some of you are part of it. 
but I can certainly say I'm not part of it. But I love it. Um, I'm very fond of stained glass windows from the Middle Ages. Uh, did, you ever, did you ever think about art too? Art from whether it's Praxelides up to really the 19th century, up to Corot, it's always the rich. They're always beautiful, they're well fed, they're powerful. We really don't know what poor people look like. I mean, you could say, well, maybe Bruegel, I'm sorry I mispronounced his name, but in essence, we really don't know. But we know what the rich look like. Um, and that alone is fascinating. Uh, the poor have always been part of literature. You know, whether it's Plautus, the Latin playwright, or Terence, uh, Plautus was a, a comic writer, even Aeschylus, there are characters that are poor, they may be mocked, they're never given the same stature that say the kings and the queens are, but there they are for you to consider. Um, and as we get further along in literature uh, and away from the theater, the poor can even become heroes. So in its own way, literature is oddly democratic. So this brings me back to you again and your reading. And I would suspect that most of you have read the Declaration of Independence, which is almost a work of literature. It's really beautiful. You've probably read the Constitution. Okay, it's not a work of literature, but it's pretty darn clear. You know, I know up in Washington they make it as complicated as possible, but it's really not that complicated if you look at it. Um, so where did this come from? These are our founding documents. Our founding fathers and those mothers that were educated read Greek and Latin. If they didn't know their Greek, they certainly knew their Latin. They read Cicero. They read Seneca, that wonderful cynic who said, why get married? It's easier to hang yourself. <laughs> you gotta like a man that says something. Like that. Um, but but they, they, they read the great documents of classical Latin. They read Livy, they read Tacitus. Then they read Suetonius, which is just scandal too good to be true. Um, and if they could read Greek, they went back and they read Aeschylus, Aristophanes, Sophocles, etc. Um, but they all read the same thing. And the early works, the, the, the Latin works, particularly Cicero, poses questions about how are we to live? What is the function of a republic? Because remember, Cicero was completely married to the republic. And when it died, so did he. Of course, he was driven to it. And this, oh, just as an aside, if there had been serial killers in Rome, Cicero would have blamed them on Caesar. He blamed everything. <laughs> so, this makes me wonder if serial killers are not a more modern development in human dysfunction. But at any rate, the Republic was the ideal. It was, the, it was our ideal. And you see this reflected in all our early documents. So it seems to me that if you were really going to teach civics, and if you really wanted to understand your country, whether you're 16, a junior in high school, or whether you're an adult, you would go read the documents that they read. You would read Cicero, you would read Seneca, you would read Livy, Tacitus, if you can't read Latin, you read in translation, and things start to pop. So you and I are simply a reflection of earlier generations who made good on their literacy. Are we literate now? Not to the level that we were during the Revolutionary War. The percentage of people who could read and write was actually higher then than now. And you can say, okay, well there were only a million people on the coast. Nonetheless, it's still an impressive percentage. We have a very high illiteracy rate in this country, more than many people would care to admit. But even if people can read and write, they are culturally illiterate. We've made a commitment not to know, because it's difficult. When you think of some of those books that you read, some of them were very difficult. You had to fight your way through it, but you did it. And you profited by it. And anyone who knows you probably profited by it too. But now we've made the, the choice as a nation not to, not to make the young read these things. Essentially, we're telling them they're too stupid to learn. 
Or are we too lazy to teach them? I'm not sure what's what here. But without that rigor, without that early rigor, how do you know who we are? How can we make informed judgments if we can't think, wait a minute, this is what Crassus, Pompey, and Lepidus were worried about in 43 BC. I've seen this before. I've seen John Maynard before. Okay, maybe it was 2,500 years, but I've seen this before. I've seen Harry Reid before. Didn't like him then either, did you? <laughs> but, but what we've done, what we've done is we've damaged ourselves. It's not irreparable, but it'll take hard work to get back where we are. I would be willing to bet that the most significant books that you read were the most difficult. Maybe they weren't the most difficult to understand, but they were the most difficult to accept. They were the most difficult to work through. Anna Karenina is a difficult book. Why would anybody do that? Even if you have a romantic temperament, which I certainly do not, um, why would you do that? Why would Tolstoy write that? Is he trying to, is he trying to show us the terrible imbalances of the age? Is he trying to show us the vast differences in temperament? Is he trying to show us, you know, the, 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 some sort of mystical difference between men and women? I don't know. But I know when I read it, you know, that, that end will get you every time. And when I was young and I read it, I was totally with her, as I'm sure you were. Now I understand Karen. Karen, and I understand her husband completely. That's why a great work of art, you can read it every decade of your life and take something away from it. So I urge you to keep reading. I know I don't have to urge you, you will. But I would love it if you would talk to your friends about what you've read and encourage them, which you probably do. But lay it on the line. It seems to me we're in such an unholy mess now. I don't think I'm the only person in the room to think that. I think the difference between the Democratic and the Republican parties is the difference between syphilis and gonorrhea. <laughs>
but it's the mentality. Animals don't compromise. That is the big difference. Humans compromise. And that's what we don't have anymore. There is no compromise in our government. And there isn't actually a lot of compromise in other areas of our life. We have, we have retracted, we've withdrawn from mixing together. I'm 70. I'm probably the oldest person in the room. But when I was a kid, you got on the trolley car, we were way out in the country, or you got on the bus when buses came by, and there was everybody in there, because who had cars? Only rich people had cars. And if you had a car, the man had it. He drove to work. So everybody else is on the bus. And you have to learn about all kinds of different people. They look differently than you do. They smell differently than you do. But everybody's talking at once. You gain the respect. You know, you knew who your neighbors were. The other big thing that we've lost, which seemed so good at the time, was the draft. This forced men together that were never together before. And they learned to trust one another because that guy had your back. Even if he was from New Jersey, he had your back, <laughs> you know? It was one of the most marvelous things we ever did in getting people to understand one another. Of course, then the Vietnam War, that all went to hell with a fairly decent reason. You're asking people to die and you're not telling them why. Um, but I wish we could bring something back that it was a, it's a national service or whatever so that we would have to work with people other than ourselves. People now live in their ghettos. They may be a glitter ghetto, but it's still kind of a ghetto. So you can talk to people who think just like you do. Well, how do you learn? There's no compromise. How can we move forward if you don't compromise? I don't know any of us that is so smart we have all the answers. Okay, maybe the cat. <laughs> but, but that's different. But I, but I just ask you to think about these things and think about your reading. And to me, the most revolutionary thing you can do is to tell the truth. Talk to your friends. Talk to other people. The only way we are now going to make a significant change we have to make is to create the groundwork. And the groundwork is simply telling the truth. And from this will come, I hope, compromise. And I hope it doesn't get co-opted the way the Tea Party did and the way the, you know, sitting down against Wall Street did. They both got co-opted. And maybe we can get us back to actually those founding documents again, the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. And there, again, we are different from animals in that respect. Foxes don't need a Constitution. They know how to live. They have it worked out. They know their boundaries. We don't know our boundaries anymore if we ever did. And this is probably not what you thought. You probably thought I was going to sit up here and talk about my books. Well, you can read my books. I'm interested, I'm interested in, in everything else that you're doing and reading and thinking because you don't want to admit it, but you're an elite. People who read are an elite. They have been an elite since Pericles. Readers make changes. Readers put two and two together. Readers say, this is wrong, let's fix it. And you know what? Charlemagne tried this, and it worked then, maybe it'll work now. And the, well, the word elite has become a, dir a dirty word, but all progress is the work of elites. And whether you wish to say you are or not, you are. That's all I have to say. <laughs>